I'm Douglas Smith and I'm the Indigenous Affairs Reporter for The Advertiser. I'm Gugatha and Murning. Those are my two First Nations. I'm from Sojourner and Oak Valley where I grew up in community. But right now I live in Adelaide in South Australia. My colleagues and I were going to tell you a story. This isn't a story for everyone, especially children. I mean that. This is serious business. We're talking about suicide and maybe even murder. It started off with Courtney Hunter Hepperman. She's an Indigenous mother and her daughter had died in 2019. Ah! <laughs> oh, you got me! Rose had been found in the backyard. Police had ruled the death of suicide very quickly. We had a lot of doubt, um, you know, surrounding her death. Like we were really shocked. Like the first that we really knew that anything was wrong is that her brother had said that she didn't turn up um, you know, to school that day. In my conversations with Courtney a few months later, she mentioned that she had been in contact with yet an, another mother who also had suspicions about her daughter's death. And that mother was Sharon Moore, the mother of Charlie Powell, um, who was 17 years old when she was found dead in a toilet block in Queanbeyan in New South Wales in 2019. And that case had also been ruled a suicide very early on. And I think at that point, I really started to think, wow, there's something going on here. What I didn't know was that Courtney's story would lead us to the families of five other Indigenous women who had all died. What we've learned is that this isn't just something that's happened to one, two, three, five, six families. This is something that's happening to Indigenous families across the country. So this podcast, basically, it follows the story of six First Nations women who have died. In each case, the family have more questions and they do answers. And, you know, basically the families don't even know how they passed away. What we've been doing over the last 12 months is we've been going and speaking to these families. And in each case, we've found that police didn't take statements from key witnesses a lot of the time. They didn't ask questions about you know, the circumstances of their relationships. And there are so many questions that are unanswered in these cases. You know, like in the statements, you know, to the police and the coroner and things, there's a lot of inconsistencies. Once we started talking to Courtney, going over to her place, interviewing her, really looking into what happened to Rose, Courtney mentioned that she had been in contact with another woman who had been in a really similar circumstance with her own daughter. That was Sue with her daughter, Lila. It did sound on the face of it like it was really similar in terms of the suspicions that Sue had about Lila's death. But Courtney told me that Sue had moved to Bali fairly recently, that she'd just become so frustrated and upset with the whole system and, and the fact that she was pushing, pushing, pushing for Lila's case to be further investigated. It's harder, it is, especially when you don't know what really, really happened. Charlene Moria had been missing for two weeks her body was found within eyeline of the search staging area and police put out a statement saying that they didn't believe that it was a suspicious death. Nothing changed for the family and they say that they weren't contacted and informed of any update. Like every parent, I just wanted answers for my daughter. Like, I, I know, I know my daughter would not have armed herself and that's all I wanted. I just, I wanted answers. So when Lasonia Dutton was found in the backyard of her family home in Wilcannia in March 2022, the family say to me that the police arrived and just treated her death as a suicide from the get-go. There was absolutely no closure. In any of these cases, there's no closure. They've lost their daughters in circumstances that they question and are still questioning four years, in some cases, down the track. Each of these families knows that it might be too late for them to get answers for their daughters or for their sisters or their loved ones. They've treated it as non-suspicious and evidence is lost, people's memories have faded. In each of these cases, the family have all done their own investigation to try and find answers. They haven't found answers and that's why, that's why they've spoken to us because, you know, this is a part where they come to the media to tell them their story so that we can highlight just how systemic this is across the entire country. And none of these families know each other, but they're all facing the same thing. And they don't feel like their voices have been heard. It's so important that we 
do know about these cases because nothing's going to ever change unless people know about it and we start talking about it and we start looking at why this is happening and what we can do to try and fix it. What we're hoping for in telling this story, telling all of these stories, is that someone will listen, that we can give these women a voice and give these families a voice so that they can be heard by the systems that need to change. The stories are shocking. The stories are horrific. Some of them are really, really hard to hear, but I think it's really important that we listen to them.